Hello everybody, my name is Dr Bob Clark. I'm the Senior Research Manager for Wessex Archaeology and today I shall be talking to you about the archaeological potential of airfields. A familiar site across the British Isles, one of Britain's largest archaeological sites you could argue, a phenomena of the 20th century as is flight and something that has developed in size and intricacy as aircraft have also uh, developed in their technological awkwardness, some would say. The archaeological potential of airfields is an interesting concept, uh, and it's one that certainly major bodies have already highlighted for us. But the tendency is that we look specifically at that airfield, and moreover, we spend an inordinate amount of time talking about the aircraft that actually fly from those sites. So what I want to do is whiz through a few type sites that I'm familiar with and just give you a flavour of where I'm coming from. At the turn of the century, the Wright brothers, 1903, conducted the first powered flight. By the outbreak of the First World War, 1914, flight was still in its infancy, but lots of different companies were um, vying for military contracts. By the end of 1918, the world was full of aircraft. Warfare and the technology race that it drives had ensured that aircraft had gone from just a few uh, possibilities for range finding from artillery and the odd pistol shot backwards and forwards through to aircraft that were able to operate at height, such as the Gotha bombers that bombed London, the German ones, and the beginnings of a credible Royal Air Force. How do airfields fit into this? Well, of course, aircraft need somewhere to land. And throughout the First World War, grass strips were good enough. These grass strips were not just fields, though. By the end of the, of the, the First World War, grass technology had gone to a incredible heights. We had different types of grass for different types of aircraft landing on them. Grass is imported from, uh, from across uh, the known empire as it was then. So introduction of other species into the landscape, and that's just the start of it. I'm talking to you today from what is left of RF Old Sarum. Now, Old Sarum, near Salisbury in Wiltshire, was a temporary depot station when it was opened late 1917, early 1918. And one of a number that were specifically designated for aircrew training. The training depot station had three squadrons of aircraft based on it, so it has three double hangars, each for a squadron. There is also a repair hangar, which is a single bay hangar, and next to that is a woodwork and blacksmith shop. And the blacksmith shop tells you something about how agricultural flight was uh, in those early days. There were 66 of these stations built, several of, the, several of them around where I am now, including Stonehenge, Boscombe Down, Lake, and Lopcombe, Lopcombe Corner, but they were built across the empire, all conforming to the same layout. Now we know this, the record is there, or it's there pretty much completely. The point to make is that, do we need to know any more than that? We know what the buildings are for, we know how the layout conforms to the, 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 the edict, which was the training at the time. I'm more interested in what other potential these sites can give us. So if we continue to think about Old Sarum, for instance, the first point to make is who built it? German prisoners of war were used in the construction of many of these stations against the law, it turns out. But the actual, if we look at the, if we look at the uh, minutiae of that, basically what was said that was that prisoners of war were not to be used in war industries. The government got round that by having them build training depots as opposed to frontline stations. The point to make is Old Serum then is awash with Germans just north of Salisbury. Well, of course, they're kept under a secure guard. It's when we look at who else was building these stations, or certainly this specific one, that we've got to start asking some other questions. The Chinese Labour Corps were also employed on this station. Now, we weren't fighting China, but we were using labour from China. So just imagine dropping off 200 Chinese 
uh, labourers who wouldn't be able to speak any English in the mid of, middle of the Wiltshire countryside. One of the problems is that whilst the German prisoners of war were fairly well policed uh, and the Chinese Labour Corps were to a certain extent, they were still allowed into Salisbury and places like that. And it wasn't long before the towns close to these new build airfields felt the full force of Chinese gambling, drinking and gangland outings. This is all well documented, but it's something that rarely is brought out when we talk about an airfield. At war's end, 1918, or the latter part of 1918, the RAF had 300 and odd stations in the UK alone. By 1922, 1923, that had been reduced to about 20. And it looked like the new force, the Royal Air Force, was going to get snuffed out. Uh, that was until um, France became rather belligerent with, with Germany over reparations for the First World War and started to flood Europe with cheap coal. Now, the problem is that cheap coal was how we were going to make our money back because we'd gone through the First World War from a, we'd started off as a gold standard nation and we'd finished off as a debtor nation. So it looked like there was, there might be a war between Britain and France. Also on the continent, uh, governments were finding it increasingly difficult to placate the massive economic issues that swept and, and characterised the mid-1920s. So Britain decided it was going to build a bomber force because the bomber will always get through as Stanley Baldwin was to tell us. The RAF began buying back stations about 50 kilometres in from the south coast in a line that became known as the Wessex, Wessex bombing area. Uh, stations such as Upper Hayford, Boscombe Down, uh, but also a ring, a fighter ring around London, which uh, which meant that there was at least four stations that could operate fighters to protect the capital. One thing this did allow the Royal Air Force to do was to stamp its own design on these stations, because prior to that, it had inherited stations that were from the First World War, like the training depot stations were actually a French design. So a number of buildings were designed. Um, new hangars, new layouts uh, for technical buildings, new accommodation blocks. The accommodation blocks go from timber hutting to two-storey barrack blocks, some of which are still extant today. If you go to what was RAF Bista, a number of those are listed and scheduled. If you go to Boscombe Down, our members of the RAF still live in those blocks in the sergeant's mess and we use the uh, station headquarters. These are like a neo-Georgian design, but they are there to show that the RAF is a new technological force and these buildings are there to fly that flag. As I mentioned earlier, we've got stations about 50 kilometres in from the south coast and then round, the rig, round London as a fighter ring. This is because the threat was perceived to be from France. Germany wasn't in the picture at this point. Um, later on in the Battle of Britain, it just shows how lucky we were that we considered France as, um, as an enemy in the mid-20s. Because when the Battle of Britain did come, the majority of aircraft launched against the British Isles were flown from French stations. So that was rather fortuitous. But what it does do is it allows us to question some of the historical narrative, looking at the archaeological landscape of those airfields. Now, again, this is well trodden. Historic England, for instance, and many interest groups have already looked at this side of things. But what they don't do is look at the social aspects so much. And it's when we come to the Second World War and the expansion period just before it that we can really start to say something about the effects of stations throughout that conflict and the influence that they had on British life. So from 1935, it was clear that, um, that there was going to be another war in Europe. Um, the French were very nervous. They had uh, Franco, Mussolini and Hitler on its three borders, and then there was the English Channel and us. And we recognised that if we were to repel any form of attack from Germany, 
we had to start meeting, if not exceeding, the amount of aircraft and airfields built uh, in the British Isles. So in 1935, the expansion schemes were born. They used letters of the alphabet sometimes, such as expansion period A, saw seven airfields built in a line basically along the A1, so along the spine of Britain, into towards the northeast side, or the eastern side, I should say. So why was that the case? Well, that was because Germany was across the North Sea. It was nothing to do with France. These schemes ran until 1940 or thereabouts, and they introduced yet another type of architecture onto the British landscape. Um, they also bring with it a number of different types of station, and this is what is important. What we want to do now is we want to move on from airfields where fighters fly or bombers fly on missions into Europe in a war of attrition with the strategic bombing campaign that starts late 1941, where up to a thousand aircraft at a time are pitted against German cities and industry. So here's a question. How long does it take to build an aircraft? In the war, they were down to two days for a Lancaster. Now, it's not possible to get those bits and assemble them in that time in one place. What was developed in 1936-37 was a scheme known as the shadow factories. So car manufacturers in the northwest of the United Kingdom and other engineering works such as Westlands, for instance, some of you are familiar with Westlands uh, helicopters and such like, they were provided with brand new factories at government expense or air ministry expense as it was or with the latest uh, te technology inside. So all the latest lathes and pillar drills and everything else that's needed and a workforce that was trained in aircraft manufacture or components of aircraft manufacture. These factories were placed back in the hands of the local factory owners on the proviso that if we move to war, they will be turned over immediately to aircraft production. So you have factories all over the United Kingdom, but certainly concentrating towards the northwest and southwest of Britain, um, producing components of aircraft. So, for instance, Rolls-Royce, as we know, is an engine manufacturer, will build engines. Doughty, which is now um, a, a firm that looks at, um, at hydraulics and pneumatics um, and various other aspects for Airbus and com companies like that. They produced uh, hydraulic components and gauges and things like that. So Smith's Industry gauges. Some factories were dispersed into the landscape. Uh, so a classic example is if we look at the Spitfire, over 22,000 aircraft built uh, in the 10 years that the Spitfire was in production. It was in production until about 1948. Goodness knows how many marks of that aircraft were built. But the majority of them were built at either Castle Bromwich or Eastleigh on the south coast at Southampton. And Southampton was bombed relentlessly on occasion. So some of that manufacturing effort was moved out into the countryside, especially in Wiltshire. They were built in at, at Trowbridge. There was a place called Chatters Hill, High Post, just up the road from where I'm sat talking to you now. Um, and probably more interesting than anything else, local factories in Salisbury itself, where maybe seven or eight airframes were built at a time. Over 2,000 of those aircraft were built in the back of garages, so, so motor garages and anywhere that could take a space, really. These were then moved in parts to high posts where they were assembled and then the aircraft was flown and delivered to wherever it was. The landscape of the Spitfire spreads far and wide and it even spreads into the centre of Salisbury where the majority of people who are putting those aircraft together, including the riveting and everything else, are women. And there is another underrated aspect of research. There is a landscape for Spitfires and other aircraft for that matter, which, which extends far beyond the fighter bases. And then the construction of these pieces, that are the, the, the component parts themselves, spread even further back 
into society itself. And we often wonder what some strange deposits are on excavations. Well, I'm not suggesting they're all aviation related, but in Salisbury, we have to consider that some parts of that may well be evidence of Spitfire production. At the end of the Second World War, there were over 700 airfields in Britain. Uh, to give you an idea um, of, of money spent, RAF Kemble, which is still a flying, uh, flying airfield today or operating airfield today, cost just over £500,000 to build in 1938. Towards the end of the Second World War, stations were getting uh, onto supersize Gatwick and Heathrow being two of those stations. As soon as an airfield was functional, and that meant as soon as an aircraft could land on it, it was handed over. Any extra buildings were built later on. Um, so a good example of this is, uh, or to give you an idea of how big this is, throughout 1942, upwards of three airfields a week were coming online. As aircraft get bigger and heavier, especially through the strategic bombing uh, campaign that we had waged right up to the end of the war, it was clear that the grass strips that had first been used in the First World War were absolutely useless. As soon as it got wet, an aircraft that weighed 35 to 40 tonnes would just bog down. So we started to see from about 1942 concrete run runways. And it was those runways, as soon as they dried, that meant aircraft could operate from them. And this is why there was very few permanent buildings on some of the later stations. It is those stations that close first after the Second World War. So all those that have very little infrastructure are disposed of again. And some of them go by 1948, 1949. But also by 1948-1949, it's clear that we're going to have another war. And that war is probably with the Soviet Union. The initial start of this is with the Berlin airlift. Now, I'm not going into that in great detail, but suffice to say, from that period on, the disposal of airfields slows somewhat. Now, the story of the Cold War would mean that I'm going to sit here for another four days and talk to you about airfields. I don't want to do that. I'm here to demonstrate some of the potential. So as we've already said, there is definitely a landscape of manufacturing, resource uh, acquisition, engineering prowess, if you like, um, the female landscape or gender based landscapes uh, and the fact that there are two to three airfields in the chain before aircraft get onto an operational base where they are used aggressively. What I want to do now is talk about um, some one or two of the specialist airfields with some unique structures on and um, what happens to an airfield when it's not an airfield anymore. Business parks, yeah, industrial landscapes, all of the above, but a number of airfields have completely disappeared off the landscape. And considering the three 2,000 foot concrete runways that were built and they're not superficially built I should add they're four and five feet thick if not more and for big jets such as the F-111 and such like we've got seven and eight meters of depth of concrete in some areas during the Cold War but these airfields while they exude permanence don't last long with a concerted developer. So, for instance, towards the ninth into the 1960s, a number of airfields along the M4 corridor, and there's your clue, disappear off the landscape. And that's because the majority of the runways and buildings are used as aggregate. This removal of airfields doesn't just happen in the, in the 1960s. When the Newbury Bypass was built in the 1990s, the first place they went for hardcore was Greenham Common. Now, Greenham Common, which is one of the more contentious airfields in the Cold War due to its association with cruise missiles in the 1980s and the uh, women's peace camp around it. It was thought really should be removed as far as possible. But interestingly, the silos or the Glickham site, as it's known, for the cruise missiles, the protected site was actually preserved and is now a scheduled monument. And to demonstrate how it has wheedled its way into um, in, into the British psyche and world psyche uh, for something completely different. That particular site was used as a rebel base backdrop in one of the latest Star Wars trilogies. 
if we look at Upper Hayford in Oxfordshire, we find that Historic England have now scheduled quite a number of the assets that are on that airfield, the avionics uh, workshops and assessment bays is a scheduled ancient monument. The avionics and reconnaissance bays are uh, a scheduled monument. The bomb dump with its nuclear assets are a scheduled monument. And so is the QRA. Now the QRA, Quick Reaction Alert, is an area within the airfield where armed F-111s, uh, nuclear aircraft, were sat ready with nuclear weapons on board to get in the air and deliver violence to the enemy, as it's known, at short notice. And that has been now uh, scheduled as well. So we are starting to value and place on the national record something of these airfields. But what about the smaller buildings? Well, if we go back to Blake Hill Farm, which is one that I've mentioned, built in 1943 stroke 1944, an A-type airfield, so it was three 2,000-foot runways. It had 700-odd buildings on it, but only 140 of those were actually physically on the airfield. The rest were associated with the airfield, but were built in small clusters around the landscape. That meant that those people that were billeted, those servicemen that were billeted, and women that were billeted in those, in those uh, small nucleuses around, interacted with the people in the village and the settlements around. So you can see that these airfields suddenly start to have an influence on settlement. Now, what's interesting about uh, Blake Hill Farm is that by 1946, 1947, it was clear it was gonna be closed because it had no infrastructure on it. GCHQ took it over and carried, carried out radio trials there for over the horizon radar and such like, well into the 1990s. A lot of this, has already been researched and looked at by Vince Povey, the curator of Blake Hill Farm. And I encourage you to have a look at his website because it is a fantastic piece of work. But what about the buildings outside? Well, they were built, they were known as temporary brick structures or Nizen huts. So the temporary brick structures are a single skin of bricks with a concrete render on the outside and an asbestos roof. The bricks, were under fired for the simple reason that they they only needed to be there for what's known as the duration, which was probably about a decade, they thought. So they turn to paste once the weather gets back to them. So uh, it's surprising that any of these are standing in the landscape, especially the two that I'm going to explain to you now. So one area near the village uh, had two Nizen huts, ablution blocks, two of those, and a few other small buildings within it. And that billeted the non-commissioned officers, the NCOs, or some of the NCOs that were based on the station. At the end of the war, the Wooden Bassett and Cricklay Town Council were told to billet people who'd been bombed out in Bristol in redundant airfield buildings within North Wiltshire. And of course, the nearly 500 that were available at, at Blake Hill Farm and the surrounding areas were pressed into use. So for a number of years, families lived in the Nizen huts and the two ablution blocks served them for their washing and daily needs. Once they'd been rehoused in, uh, in, in various aspects of uh, council housing that was built in the area, the buildings that the Nizen huts were sold off and removed, but the two ablution blocks stayed. Now, one point to make here is that they stayed because they had running water to them. And this is something we find in the landscape now that of these airfields, the temporary brick structures that survive normally have a water pipe that runs to them. So they have a secondary use beyond the initial service use. Anyway, the fact of the matter is that these two buildings are still in the landscape today. I thought it was an interesting point when I found these in 2005. I went and had a look. And so I researched back through where, why they were still there. And we discovered they'd been a small shop. Then they became a village school, or the village school, I should say. And the village school was open for at least 20 years. Then the new school was built, so the, um, so the children moved on and cattle moved in. So they were used to house cattle and became an agricultural building. When I saw them in, in early 2000s, the roofs were falling in and they were derelict. And I thought they were just about on their way 
to being totally left lost from the landscape. Somebody put planning permission in and has changed those what were recognised in the paperwork as agricultural buildings into stables, refurbishing those two buildings. So 80 years on, they survive in the landscape, but with very different usage throughout that 80 years. And this is what we need to be doing now is starting to look at how these buildings interact with their landscape beyond the militaristic side of things. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I work for Wessex Archaeology in Salisbury. And for those of you that haven't visited our, our head office, it's actually in a military building perched on the edge of Old Sarum Airfield. So this particular building I'm in at the moment was built 1932-1933. And it's interesting because it has the last vestiges of the air defence of Great Britain, neo-Georgian aspects to it, but it, it also has some of the new expansion period um, aspects to it as well. This particular piece I'm in at the moment is a two-storey office block with a range of offices. At the rear it has two operations rooms, similar to those ones you see on war films with the WAF pushing the little blocks of numbers around on a map with a pool cue or sort of pool cue demonstrating where the enemy forces are and how the RAF spitfires or hurricanes are forming up. What we've got here, as I say, two. Now, whether they were actually used in earnest or not, we're not sure, but certainly they were used for training purposes, first in the air war, but later on with um, army cooperation. So, um, so the, and we're talking now 1950s, 1960s. As the name implies, Army Corporation is where the RAF and the Army Battalions uh, work in close union. So this site was used to train those operations in the Cold War. Today, these are our uh, project officers' rooms and our fines room, but a lot of the features still remain. The problem with a big map in an ops room is that it is too big to see from the ground. So senior officers or people under training that need to see the whole battle developing need to be above it. And our ops rooms still retain their galleries to view the map from above or from the second story with most of the original features still in. This includes the windows that open inwards so they don't cast light or a reflection on the map. There, there are other subtle features in this building, um, such as the radiators. Anyone who'd been to a Victorian school would recognise the radiators that we have in this building. And recently, when the building was refurbished, the radiators were removed, they were sandblasted, and uh, about six inches of paint were taken off each one, and they're now back pristine in our drawing office. Next to the ops building is the medical centre. Now that's quite an interesting small building as well, a bungalow with a number of features again that um, give away its original use. It has double doors in for a start off. Within the atrium, all the corners are removed from the corridors and that means that you can swing a stretcher around those a lot quicker. Two operating rooms are directly off those. There is, also, um, there is also a dental room, a storage room, and probably most telling of all out in the car park is a small mortuary. Some stations have interesting contraptions on them. One such site is Boscombe Down in Wiltshire, home of the aeroplane and armament experimental establishment from 1939-1940. It went on to test the majority of aircraft and weapons uh, intended for frontline use in the Cold War. So we need to go back to 1939-1940 to talk about this piece of industrial heritage, which has sadly just been removed. So known as the Blower Tunnel, this was a 45 foot long tube with four Rolls-Royce Merlins in it and four 10-foot blades. 
too sucking and too blowing to provide a parallel airflow out of a nozzle up to 250 miles an hour. They didn't trial models, they trialled the whole aircraft, full-sized. We were flying bombers over Germany in 1939-1940 and these aircraft were being picked off even though they were operating at night because the, the exhausts were glowing red on the engines and there was a blue flame flash. The fact is a night fighter that saw four of these shot in the middle and usually brought the Lancaster or the, the four engine aircraft down. So in 1941, a new contraption was devised and this was the blower tunnel. The idea was that it provide, uh, it would provide a blast of air over the engine so that not you didn't have to check one port, you could check all 24 on a Merlin engine, for instance, at once. The alternative was to actually wait for a dark night and fly the Lancaster or whichever engine it was in the aircraft concern around the Wiltshire countryside at about 50 feet with observers uh, dispersed out in the countryside. There's a few problems with that. First of all, you do not get too consistently uh, lit nights, if you like, the moon or whatever, or cloud in Wiltshire. Secondly, flying at 50 feet in the dark was in those days quite unheard of and, and it was placing aircrew at risk. So therefore, between, uh, between engine aircraft being unserviceable or unable to fly, being able to fly in the wrong weather and things like that, certification of new engines was taking months instead of weeks. A blower tunnel meant that you could check all the ports in one go and you could probably stand that aircraft on the ramp in front of the blower and achieve the whole 50 hour test in three days. Well, by the time it was actually finished through political wranglings and, and resources and everything else, it was 1944 and D-Day before the first tests were run. And the very first aircraft that this particular blower tunnel had in front of it was the V-1 flying bomb, which at that time was practically unknown. The RAE at Farnborough built um, built engines out of cobbled together pieces found in the street and those that had been smuggled out by the Dutch resistance, built a working model and ran it in front of the Boscombe Down blower tunnel. So the blower tunnel worked with technologies that were far removed from those that were envisaged for it when it actually first came into being. At the end of the war, um, something quite monumental had happened. And that was the fact that jet aircraft had come into being. At speeds of 150 to 200 miles an hour, it was difficult to bail out of a Spitfire because the air pressure kept you in the cockpit. Imagine travelling at three to 400 miles an hour. So ejection seats were developed and ejection seats were trialled in front of the Boscombe blower tunnel. As were anti-icing systems, as were various jet engines, as were various pieces of aircraft that had crashed to see if they could rec uh, recreate what went on. The last aircraft to be on this particular facility was the Eurofighter in 2000. After that, it stood, lamenting uh, times past for at least 15 years before it was unceremonially crunched up for scrap in 2016. Now, this was a unique facility which had spanned most of the aviation history of Britain. It had had most of the aircraft from the 1940s upwards stood in front of it, and it helped build a system of escape that has saved thousands of aircrew lives over the years. The reason I tell you this, as I say, is because it was scrapped, because when it really comes down to it, we have to ask ourselves, what value do we place on structures such as this? Since the end of the Cold War, airfield closures have gathered pace. And in the last 30 years since the wall came down, we have lost practically every airfield in this country to development or some form of other use. Now, I am saying that there is other use that we can recognise and map. But there comes a point when we have to say we're going to value these sites. So what have we done? Well, we've been in quite a scattergun approach, but we've been across a number of topics now. Everything from the Chinese Labour Corps to Star Wars, pretty much. 
uh, and everything in between, schools, stables, you know, you name it. So the point we're making is that, that every airfield has some form of social story to it, but it is not all about just operating aircraft. Airfields are a story of resource acquisition. They're a story of um, population movement. How many brides went to America in the Second World War, for instance? How many German prisoners of war from the First and Second World War stayed in this country after the war? The, the, the list is endless. And what I want people to do is realise, above all, that when you see an airfield, don't just think aircraft flew from there. Think about the social impact of these stations and think about what it must have been like to live in a village in Suffolk and suddenly have 2,000 American servicemen and women plonked on your doorstep. But also when you see these airfields, especially the Royal Air Force airfields, don't forget there is a thread of airfields behind that that were involved with the test and development of aircraft, releasing them to service. And this is throughout the Cold War as well. Aircraft maintenance units, which were main, which serviced the majority of aircraft, and that again carried on right throughout the Cold War. RAF St. Athen was a good example. For upwards of 20 years, it operated as the tornado servicing unit, but it also serviced Vulcans, Phantoms, Harriers, and a range of other aircraft. It was a massive civil employer as well. So the economic driver to that landscape was that airfield, but that airfield did not fly aircraft operationally. But these airfields also demonstrate the acquisition of resources, resources for building aircraft, which were rarer and rarer as time went on. Of course, we would be amiss if we didn't point out that all these airfields are on the British landscape for one reason and one reason only. And that is the defence of this nation. But as Vince Povey tells me, we must not forget those that did fly from these stations and their histories, although well trodden, still need to be told to every generation. So not only are we interested in the archaeology of airfields as a potential to looking at social change, resource change, and how Britain reacted through the 20th century to a new technology which started off with string bags and ended up with nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver them at 1500 miles an hour. We are also interested in those men and women who put their life on the line to ensure that we can be here at this conference today.